Hi everyone and good afternoon. I warmly welcome you all to the research sessions of Allied Health Sciences of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotunavala Defence University, Sri Lanka, under the theme Security, Stability and National Development in the New Normal. And you are joined here today for the technical session three, which will be on the studies that have been carried out in the field of pharmacy. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee, we warmly welcome all guests and invitees in this unique gathering. Also, we warmly welcome with respect the panel of judges of the session, a word of kind ratings to senior and junior academics, military officers, presenting authors, students, and also all conference delegates present in the audience. Before commencing the session, Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise up with the university anthem. Sessions proceedings, I cordially invite the chairperson of the session, Dr. Darshana Kotahachi, the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, KDU, accompanied by Ms. S.U. Kankanange, Senior Lecturer, Department of Pharmacy, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, KDU, to take their seats on the stage. In this session, we will have the opportunity of listening six presenters who have been conducting their studies in the field of pharmacy. The following are the presenters of the session. Ms. W. O. N. D. Silva, Ms. S. P. N. M. Senadira, Ms. T. I. S. Ruberu, Mr. N. R. M. Nelumdenia, Ms. R. H. M. P. D. Madahasa, and Ms. B. L. C. Saman Malik. Ladies and gentlemen, to formally introduce the chairperson of the session, Dr. Darshana Kothashi, may I have the honor of inviting with respect Mr. A. R. N. Silva, Senior Lecturer and Head of the Department of Basic Sciences, 
Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, KDU. Dr. Darshana Fathaji, presently engaged in duties as a senior lecturer and dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, General Sir John Kotalara Defend University, Perahara. Dr. Darshana started his medical career as a medical laboratory technologist, Department of Hematology and Histopathology, Apeksha Hospital, Maharagama. After completing 11 years service as a MLT, he joined School of MLT, National Institute of Health Sciences, Kalutara, as a member of teaching staff and served nearly four years. He, hoped, he obtained a basic degree from University of Peradeniya. He obtained his MPhil degree from University of Colombo, Sri Lanka, collaboration with Uppsala University, Sweden, while working in the MLT service. In 2014, he achieved doctorate degree from University of Colombo, Sri Lanka, collaboration with University of Turku, Finland, in the field of proteomics and experimental hematology. His PhD activities were confined to cutting edge technology based on hematological research at Finland. And he was able to publish the first and foremost international paper related to hematological malignancies called Polycystemia vera and proteomics in red blood cells. Furthermore, Dr. Rajana service had been rendered to allied health faculties in the government sector universities other than KDU. First by engaging academic activity as a visiting lecturer and examiner at the department of MLS, University of Runa, attached to the Karapati Medical Faculty. Second by coordinating and developing MLS degree program at Open University, Sri Lanka. Presently, he continues his advanced technology-based research in uh, blood-related malignant disease such as leukemia and lymphoma. In the recent past, he received research grant from KDU to investigate the potential of leaf extract and herbal plant against COVID-19. It is a joint research with the Department of Pharmacy, FHS KDU. Optimistically, it will create a path to link ethnopharmacology uh, by contributing longer term solution to the, this pandemic situation. Sir, over to you, sir. Thank you very much for introducing me, uh, Mr. Rajit. And so let's uh, start the final session of this uh, KDU IRC 2014. Uh, as explained, there are six presenters here. And uh, may I introduce the judges first? The judges. The judges of this session. Yeah, Dr. Halahakon, the head department of pharmacy, uh, and Dr. Halahakon, the head department of pharmacy, and Dr. Peshala, and uh, department of basic sciences, uh, as the judges. And uh, let me introduce. Let, let me explain the rules. And you will be given 10 minutes time for the presentation. And at eight minutes, we will ring a bell, first bell. And after 10 minutes, we will ring the second bell. Then you have to stop the presentation maximum for 12 minutes. So after 12 minutes, you will not be allowed to conduct your presentation. And if you have any problems of uh, the, the, the audio video facilities, you can directly contact us and the slide moving and everything, and you can contact us. Right. So let's start the first presenter. The first presenter is WON De Silva, uh, Knowledge, Attitudes and Practices in e -Health Literacy among FAHS undergraduates of KDU. 
and the paper of W. O. N. De Silva, R. A. N. Hansamali, B. D. G. D. J. Kamal, S. U. Kanka Nangi, and U. T. N. Senara. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. A very good afternoon to the board of judges, all the lecturers, and everyone who has joined online. Uh, I'm Monishi De Silva, and I'll be presenting about knowledge, attitude, and practice on e-health literacy among FHS undergraduates of KDU. On behalf of my team, Madam S. U. Khan Kanamge, Dr. U. T. N. Sena Ratna, B. D. J. Kamel, and R. A. N. Hansamali. Uh, this is the list of content. Introduction, e-health is an emerging field of medical informatics, public health and business referring to health services and information delivered or enhanced through the internet and related technology. This is an efficient and convenient way to gather health information. E-health literacy can be afflicted by factors such as age, sex, education level, availability and accessibility of the internet and the level of remuneration. Common barriers could be lack of computer access, high cost of uh, high cost of internet connection and poor knowledge of internet use. Uh, electronic resources such as smartphones provide tools such as a uh, wearable technology and mobile health application to people from which they can obtain basic health information in order to make correct decisions on health related issues. Allied health professionals should have the awareness, positive acceptance and the required skills to use e-health literacy effectively and efficiently in order to deliver high quality service to the patient. The necessity of e-health will emerge to the top gathering in gathering medical information as time is the most common limitation faced by all healthcare workers. Uh, justification and objective, less number of studies are available which assess the knowledge, attitude and practice of e-health literacy among allied health and undergraduates of Sri Lanka. And also literature was evident that uh, e-health literacy rate was low among allied health students. Therefore, this survey was aimed to evaluate the above mentioned aspects among the undergraduates of Faculty of Allied Health Science in Sir John Kotalavya Defense University. Methodology, we use descriptive cross-sectional study. In our study population, it, it included all the undergraduates of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, KDU, during the study period of 2020. And everyone who gave their consent was included in the study, and those who did not give their consent was excluded from the study. We had a sample size of approximately 400 students from first year to fourth year from all the departments of FHS, KDU. We use convenient sampling method due to its feasibility. And quantitative data was collected from, from a self-administered flow-centered questionnaire after obtaining ethical approval. The, e, the questionnaire was developed by modifying the questionnaire, which was created by Cameron D. Norman, and this was pre-tested before used in our sample. The EHILS measures consumers' knowledge, perceived skills, and the application of electronic health information to the health problems. Knowledge and attitude were measured using a five-point five, five Likert scale, where response options range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. The practice was assessed in five dimensions. Data was analyzed using SPSS statistic, and quant bar coefficient alpha was used to measure internal consistency. Mean was used for normally distributed data, and percentages and frequencies was used to represent categorical data. Linear regression was carried out to find the association between variables and p-values which were less than 0.05 was considered significant among the obtained parameters. Results, total of 407 students answered our survey. Results illustrated that 67.8 have used fitness apps and uh, uh, around accessed all information, 27 accessed all listed information from where 10 were B farm, seven physiotherapy, five nursing, and four medical laboratory science, and one radiography student. The majority used the internet to search health tips. The usefulness of the internet in making decisions about health was found very important by 66.1%, while 3.7% found it not important at all, while 14.3% were 
unsure about the usefulness of the internet in making decisions. The total score of EHELS was summed to range from 8 to 40, where the highest score represented high self perceived e health literacy. After reviewing valid published literature, EHELS score of 26 was used as the breakoff point for either high or low e health literacy. Uh, in this table, you can see the descriptive statistics of e-health knowledge and attitude among gender intake and department is given. With regard to gender, highest knowledge mean was shown by male and highest attitude mean was shown by female. With regard to intake, intake 34 showed high attitude mean, while intake 35 showed highest attitude, uh, sorry, highest knowledge mean. With regard to department, B farm showed the highest attitude mean and radiotherapy showed the highest uh, knowledge mean. In this table, the summary of distributional properties and internal consistency of knowledge and attitudes on e-health literacy is given. With regard to knowledge, knowledge had a skewness ranging from minus 1.538 to minus 0.431, and a kurtosis ranged from minus 0.472 to 5.368 with a Kornbach coefficient of 0.85. And 84.02% obtained higher score from the e-health literacy scale, while 15.98 obtained low score from the e-health literacy scale. With regard to attitude, uh, it had a skewness of minus 1.348 to minus 0.222, and a kurtosis range from minus 0.321 to 4.513, with a con bar constant of 0.754. In this table, you can see the linear regression for knowledge, attitude, and practice on e-health literacy. Intake had an association with knowledge, while degree and intake both had an association with attitude but only gender had an association with practice. Here, all the p-values which are less than 0 0.05 were considered significant. Discussion, the results obtained revealed that allied health undergraduates used the internet to obtain health-related information, but none used credible or uh, reputed databases and websites like PubMed. The majority of individual e-health literacy was at an acceptable level. Most of the part participants were willing to recommend a mobile health application created by health professionals. So this could be an important finding where we can encourage the health professionals to develop such apps uh, to help their patients. The usage of mobile health application by female were greater than the male usage. There was a positive relationship between increasing the year followed and the e-health literacy with attitude indicated that the students are using acquired knowledge through their degrees to improvement of better health care. The usage pattern varied among participated undergraduate according to the degree they followed. The present study showed only 49.01% had trust on the quality of the health related information on the internet. In this study, we obtained an uh, e-heals mean score of 28.83, which was more or less similar to 28.96 uh, obtained by a study in Jordan among nursing students, and also to the score of 28.21, which was obtained in Iran among medicine and health science students. This study summarizes internet access and e-health literacy is at a satisfiable level, and the students have a greater tendency to use healthcare apps. Previous studies have shown that when the education level increases, e health literacy tends, tends to increase, increase, uh, increase, supporting our findings. Conclusion The internet use for health related areas is prominent among allied health science undergraduates of KDU. The majority of the student population had acceptable levels of knowledge, attitude, and practice on health information which is available online. We would like to recommend uh, this study as a foundation to carry out further comparison with allied health graduates, postgraduates, and also other studies as to evaluate health information available online along with searching skills and quality resolutions. Furthermore, arrangements should be made to carry out uh, training sessions on how to search and obtain health information through credible resources. The limitations we faced, we had difficulties uh, due to uh, in collection of data due to the prevailing pandemic situation. And this, this has a constraint on generalizability as the study was conducted only on a sample of a single population due to the limited resources and time. Since this was our very first study of the research of our research group, we lacked previous experiences. This is the list of references which we used. And we would like to express our gratitude to our supervisors, all heads of departments, and all the undergraduates of FHS KDU and to everyone who was listening. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Silva, for excellent presentation. Now this is open for the question, and there are two audiences. First one, the physical one here, and even the virtual one. Uh, judges, you can ask questions. Yeah, uh, that you have a used uh, questionnaire here. Uh, I would like to know whether this questionnaire was uh, created by your uh, research team or you have used a standard questionnaire which is available already. Uh, as mentioned, we used the questionnaire which was created by uh, Cameron D. Norman and uh, we did some modifications. After the modifications, we had a pilot test and then only we used it in our samples. Okay, then uh, you have used uh, closed ended questions. Uh, yes. so do you know the difference between the closed ended questions and open ended questions? Yes, closed ended questions gives you a, a minimum number of responses, while open ended questions gives you um, gives you freedom to give your answers, responses. Okay, and one one more thing that uh, did you op obtain ethical approval for this uh, study? Yes, madam, we have, uh, we have obtained our ethical approval from KDU. Yes, but it was not uh, mentioned here and you haven't mentioned it there. So when it is uh, related to human study, it is a fundamental that you have to mention, right? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, madam. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I have one small question so that's uh, about your fi findings. So this thing is basically before the uh, that uh, undergraduate students. So this findings, according to these findings, uh, this data, or do you have any uh that uh, idea to use particular type of data to improve the uh that basically knowledge attitude and practice in the patients also when they are working with the patients uh and the community and uh how your research data can be implemented to to that work this is a little bit beyond on this study but anyhow there is any way you identified something interesting to use particular type findings to uh, since this study was done in the point of uh, allied health undergraduates we didn't uh -huh. do it in the point of patients view so i think uh, it's more towards the allied health undergraduate side than to the patient's benefits yeah, it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So the thing is about the, the credibility of the data. So if you thinking about the internet, so there is a lot of data, but most of the data it's uh, don't have that much uh, trust source. So if you use particular type specific apps or other type of information libraries and also database, so how are you going to validate or get some kind of credibility about those data if the student and the other customers is using particular data so is there is any guarantee and how you get some idea about the quality of that data and uh, yeah uh, like from the study also uh, we are like we got to know that only 49 percent had uh, trust on the quality of uh, available data in the internet so i think uh, we have to develop uh, systems or regulations to uh, validate this data and uh, then we can recommend some apps or something for the patients for use as well. So I think it's more into regulations that we have to do. Yeah, that's okay. That's a good idea. Thank you. Any questions? The virtual audience?
Yeah, you can ask the question now. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your important uh, presentation. In your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the trustable uh, apps. So, did you do any survey kind of thing in Sri Lankan context? Did you find any trustable apps in Sri Lanka? Because as far as I know, there are some trustable uh, apps, but they charge. So directly you can consult that uh, healthcare professionals. So did you do something uh, literature on that? Uh, no, sir, we didn't do such literature on that. Okay, do you think that is important? Yeah, I think it's important. So when and it comes to the Sri Lankan context? And if we can give it free of charge, it will be like it will be used by many people than if we charge. Yes. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to raise one more question that uh, you have uh, stated that uh, in your conclusion that uh, uh, it is a satisfactory level. How you have determined the satisfactory level? Is it uh, relative to other studies that have been done previously or how you have determined it? Uh, from the results we obtained, like uh, knowledge was assessed using the E-Heal e scale. The attitude also was uh, measured using the five-point Likert scale. From those, from all the scores we obtained, like it was at a satisfactory level. And also we used for e uh, 26 as the cutoff since it was used in other studies as well. So that's how we uh, stated that uh, knowledge, attitude and practice is at a satisfactory level. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Silva. And next, uh, we move to the next presentation. SP and then Senabine. Evaluations of in vitro antibacterial activity and anti-inflammatory activity of art corpus nobilis. The authors, N. Senadira, S. Fernando, L. Vikramasekara, Y. Fernando, and they are in this evening. Over to you. Okay, thank you, sir. I'll share my screen now. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Chairperson, Board of Judges, HRDs, guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Nimesha Senadira, and I'm from Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences, FHS KDU. The topic of my presentation is evaluation of in vitro antibacterial activity and anti inflammatory activity of Artocarpus nobilis. So let's get started. Well, let me begin the introduction by explaining why we selected this topic. As medical laboratory science undergraduates, we did many microbiology related practicals. So we thought we should use our knowledge and hand skills and do something useful in this field. As we all know, rising antimicrobial resistance and the serious side effects of anti-inflammatory agents have led to increased concern for natural alternative remedies. In that case, Medicinal plants stand out as potent yet safer option. Well, do you know there are over 1,400 species of medicinal plants in Sri Lanka? Some of them are used in folk and Ayurvedic medicine, but most of them are not scientifically evaluated or explored. One such plant species is Artocarpus nobilis. Artocarpus nobilis. You may have heard about it as Baldel or Sinhaladel, but did you know it has many medi medicinal properties and it is used in folk and Ayurvedic medicine. Artocarpus nobilis is endemic to Sri Lanka. This is what our ancestors consumed before the British comes and introduced the breadfruit, so-called Ratadel, to Sri Lanka. In here, I have organized the properties of Artocarpus nobilis into three main parts. 
First, the pharmacological properties like antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant properties. Secondly, the ethanomedicinal properties where different plant parts are used. For example, bark is used for dysentery and muscle strain, latex is used for worm infestation, bark and latex used for abscesses and blisters, and so on. And then we move on to the phytochemicals like flavonoids, flavones, terpenoids, xanthones, and many more are present in Artocarpus nobilis. Let's now move on to the objectives of our study. As I said at the beginning, our objectives were to evaluate antibacterial activity against Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus aureus by using agar well diffusion method and the evaluation of in vitro anti-inflammatory activity using heat-induced protein denaturation method. Okay, let me now turn on to the methodology we used. In here, I will explain the main steps of the study. First, we collected well-grown, fully expanded, fresh leaves and bark parts of Artocarpus nobilis from an estate in Gampaha district. Then the plant parts were identified and authenticated by National Herbarium Peradenia. Next, dried and blended plant powder was used for the extraction process. The four extractions were prepared using decoction extraction method, which is also utilized in RAD preparations. Uh, to extract fluids from a uh, hard plant material such as roots and bark. Next, dimethyl sulfoxide was used to resuspend the extract and distilled water was used to prepare the cereal dilution starting from 100 mg per milliliter to 1.25 mg per milliliter. So nine dilutions were prepared. Then the antibacterial activity was performed uh, against Esorius and E. coli bacteria using agar well diffusion method. The gentamicin was used as the positive control and DMSO was used as the negative control, uh, which we observed there was no uh, sort of inhibition. Next, the in vitro anti-inflammatory activity was performed using uh, heat-induced ethylbumine denaturation method. For, the, uh, for that, eight dilutions were prepared for the reference drug sample and for the plant extract uh, using distilled water and the dilution series were 15.625 to 2,000 microgram per milliliter. In here, distilled water was used as the negative control. Percentage inhibition of protein denaturation of the dilution series and the reference drug was recorded and the experiment was performed three times. Well, that concludes the methodology and now let's move on to the results and discussion of the study. First, the antibacterial activity results against E. coli. As you can see in this table, the highest zone of inhibition that was at 100 mg per deciliter concentration was given by methanol leaves and dichloromethane bark extract. Half maximal effective concentration or the EC50 value is lowest in the hexane and DCM bark extract. If you consider the potency of this extract, aqueous bark extract has the highest potency out of all as it has lowest EC50 value. Take a look at these curves. These are the dose response curves of the extracts against E. coli. If you see the parallel line drawn at the 50% response of Y axis, it intersects with the aqueous bark extract of the curve, first, which denotes the highest efficacy of all. Let's now look, uh, look at the next table, which shows the result of antibacterial activity against S. aureus. The highest zone of inhibition was at a 100 mg per deciliter was given by methanol leaf extract and methanol bark extract. Lowest EC50 value was observing methanol bark extract, which has the highest potency. If you see this in this curve, if, uh, it's the same as the parallel line drawn at 50% re response, it intersects with the methanol bark extract curve first. Therefore, that indicate methanol bark has the highest efficacy of all against S. aureus. The table on this slide shows the results of anti-inflammatory activity, half maximal inhibitory concentration, or the IC50 value of the positive control diclofenac sodium is 243.4 microgram per milliliter, and methanol bark extract exhibited the highest potency, which is almost similar protein inhibition to the standard uh, diclofenac sodium. If you see in this curve at the parallel line drawn at 50% response, it intersects with the methanol bark extract curve first. Therefore, that indicates methanol bark has the highest efficacy of all. 
Finally, I like to highlight the key results of our study. Aqueous bark is showed the highest efficacy and potency against E. coli. Methanol bark shows the highest efficacy and potency against S. aureus. Methanol bark shows the highest efficacy and potency for anti-inflammatory activity. As you can see, uh, the bark extract of the Artocarpus nobilis have marked in vitro dose-dependent activity. Folk and Ayurvedic literature also lines with the current findings. As I mentioned in the ethnomedicinal properties, bark is used to treat bacterial infections and inflammation. These antibacterial and anti-inflammatory activities are likely to be mediated via synergic effects of the flavonoids, alkaloid, phenol, xanthons like phytochemicals present in the plant. However, further studies are necessary to determine the mechanisms and the active constituents responsible for these antibacterial and anti-inflammatory activities. Based on the study, based on the results of the study, we, uh, we like to suggest you to carry out the phytochemical screening and analysis to identify the minimum inhibitory concentration, to investigate antibacterial and anti-inflammatory activity of other plant parts, such as roots, flowers, fruits, and latex, and a further analysis to isolate the specific anti-inflammatory and antibacterial principles present in them. So these are the references that I have used. Before I finish, I'd like to give my sincere gratitude to our supervisor, Mr. A. R. N. Silva, for his advices, guidance, and suggestions given to us for the completion and the successfulness of our study. For Dr. Darshana Kottahachi for arranging the necessary facilities to carry out the research during the pandemic situation. For Dr. Kitsuke Jayasekar for his support to complete this study successfully and all the academics and non-academics and lab staff members of KDU who supported us to complete the research successfully. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for the informative presentation, Ms. Senadira. Now this is open first for the judges to ask their questions. Uh, can you please uh, tell me details about, about your collection of samples? How you have collected them? Uh, from where and how? how uh, yes, we, yeah, we collected uh, the two plant parts, leaves and bark, uh, from Gampaha district, uh, from an estate in Gampaha district. Uh, we used uh, fully grown, well expanded, uh, fresh leaves and bark parts from the uh, from the, the selected tree. Uh, yeah, the both are mature. The tree is a mature tree, and the leaves we chosen is a mature mature leaves, uh, and from the bark, uh, we used uh, the up to uh, phloem. And uh, is uh, that that is only from one tree, right? Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that uh, in your uh, this inflammatory study, what yes. is the protein that you have used for protein denaturation uh, method? Yes, we used egg albumin denaturation. Okay. And uh, in your uh, this. Uh, Ega disc method, uh, what is the negative control you have used? Uh, we use DMSO as the negative control because there are studies that suggest that DMSO have antibacterial activity some, to a, some extent. Uh, to uh, see that uh, also we used uh, DMSO and there was no sign of inhibition. So we can say that DMSO doesn't have an effect uh, in antibacterial activity in this study. Okay, uh, but you have used uh, several uh, four types of uh, uh, sol solvents there. So yes, just use uh, DMSO then as the Sorry. negative control. Haven't yeah. you used uh, those uh, solvents uh, separately as negative controls? Uh, no, madam, we use DMSO as the negative control. Okay, and one more uh, that uh, you said that uh, you, uh, you have observed that uh, the action is uh, in methanol and aqueous solvents. Uh, why do you, why uh, what what do you think about that? Why you got that such uh, results? Uh, yeah, the main reason is uh, there are phytochemicals that are the, those are the main reason for these activities, and uh, they have different uh, solubility and uh, so different solubility according to the polarity. Uh, so aqueous and methanol are polar solvents, and I think. Uh, the flavon and flavonoids uh, and other polar uh, phytochemicals that are present in the plant are dissolving these solvents. 
that's why i think um, most of the polar uh, phytochemicals are dissolved in those solvents so uh, i think that's why they uh, it gives the highest activity okay thank you thank you Mani. Uh, hello, I have a small question. Uh, you know that uh, for prepare the extract, they, we can use a different methods. No? So in here, awesome. you select the decoction method. So there is any reason to select specific uh, method. So did you try uh, another method to prepare the extract? And uh, do you, do you already did the analysis for the those extracts also. So after that, uh -huh. you select the decoction method or just you select? No, sir, we did a pilot study using maceration extraction, uh, but uh, the yield was very low and the concentration was low and the results were not satisfactory that much. So uh, we thought of using a, another method. Uh, so that's why we chose decoction method using a reflux apparatus. Do you think that's related with the phytochemical components? That's basically its chemical structure and the polarity also, I think. Uh, yes, sir, the extraction method, uh, if we use a good extraction method, we can uh, get a good yield and good concentration. Uh, as Since we use the reflux, uh, reflux apparatus, the solvents, uh, I mean, we can obtain a concentrated extracts, more concentrated than uh, I think that will be, but there, there, are, there, are, uh, there are in some literature, they say about the heat labile, uh, compounds are damaged, but uh, we chose the uh, temperature according to the boiling points. And uh, according to the activity, I think uh, it has not affected that much. Uh, it's okay. Uh, that's the uh, other thing is you that uh, did you pay your attention about the result in uh, when you that shows some uh, tables there is about the antibacterial activity. Can you uh, go back on uh, now? It's okay. So, anyhow. Uh, when you show that table, uh, it's there is a result about the uh, ethanol extract and also the aqueous extracts. Extract. Yes. So there is a uh, they demonstrate the different activity about against the different stem uh, about the E. coli and also the Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, I think it's basically why that's much difference they are showing uh, that uh, in the aqueous extract is. Uh, good for the uh, good for against the E. coli and the ethanol extract is uh, best for the uh, Staphylococcus aureus. I think it's basically what do you think? It's depend on the chemical composition uh, or any yes. other related because the methanol also in some cases can be do some antibacterial activity. Yes, that's right. Uh, I think it's because of the com chemical composition and. Uh, again, it can be due to the different solubilities of the uh, phytochemicals in different solvent, uh, methanol and aqueous extract. Uh, yeah, that's what. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, another thing is uh, which, uh, con uh, how much concentration you use uh, for the extract, ethanol, that uh, 50%, 60%, or the 70 or pure ethanol used? Uh, we used. Uh, uh, 70% ethanol aside. 70%. Yeah. So any reason to select 70%? Uh, we select the solvents according to the literature. Uh, ah. the... Okay. So thank you. Okay. Hello. Uh, let me have a question. First of all, may I uh, appreciate your piece of research? Uh, I have two questions. First one is you have mentioned about uh, IC50 values. Yes, sir. And the units per milligrams per ml? Uh, microgram per milligram. Yes, but you have mentioned it as a milligram per ml. It's also right in your table. Oh, that may be a mistake for IC50. Yeah, that's a big, very big mistake, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For, right. for IC50, it must be microgram. So you have to correct it. And yes. the second one, how did you calculate IC50 value? Uh, we use the, uh, this drawing graph and statistical. We use a prism graph that eight version. So exactly. in that, yeah. But you have not uh, showed the, uh, the the statistical data there, no? In the in the presentation, if you have if you would have showed that uh, data, that uh -huh. also very useful, right? Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. The other thing is now you selected 
the very important topic we have selected the very important topic uh, called anti the inflammation this is the inflammation that is always associated with these covid infections the inflammation because always the when inflammation comes the tissue damage we observe in addition this uh, inflammation consumes lot of oxygen so therefore that is the reason for the hypoxia also in these covid patients so now in this case now you have you demonstrated the early results showing showing that uh, this the, the particular plant having this anti inflammatory uh, property so how do you uh, extend this study uh, for the to develop this uh, we'll say the path, the pathway to develop a drug inflammatory drug uh, in this such condition uh, yes sir. Uh, as we all know during inflammation uh, the chemical mediators are released and free radicals are released uh, so due to those things also the tissue damage will occur so in this plant uh, the literature uh, when we uh, go through the literature we have found that uh, some studies done on the phytochemistry and they have found that antioxidant and anti uh, antioxidant activity mainly uh, present in this plant and uh, when we go through the phytochemical uh, studies that are done on they are uh, they have found that uh, flavonoids terpenoid phenols uh, polyphenols like uh, phytochemicals are present so these phytochemicals are can be the main reason for this anti-inflammatory activity because uh, flavonoids have anti-inflammatory and analgesic activities uh, and they inhibit uh, certain inflammatory agents like interleukins prostaglandins like them and terpenoids can inhibit uh, phospholipase a2 um, and block the mechanism of uh, arachidonic acid uh, regarding that mechanism and uh, phenols they can inhibit uh, certain enzymes that are in the inflammation uh, so uh, i think uh, we have to uh, actually we have to do further studies to identify these uh, chemicals and the mechanisms how they do the anti-inflammatory activity uh, as the next steps and uh, i think uh, these phytochemicals are all, all the phytochemicals are uh, found in those studies are using advanced techniques like PLC and MR spectroscopy like techniques. So I think um, I think these uh, due to these uh, phytochemical chemicals, the anti-inflammatory uh, activities uh, exert, and we have to do further studies to identify the mechanism to how, how to, uh, how to uh, first we have to identify the phytochemicals that are responsible for the anti-inflammation. Uh, and then we have to uh, develop a method to how to identify the mechanisms, how how these things, uh, how these chemicals uh, in in uh, act as anti-inflammatory activities, and which uh, which pathways they act on. Uh, and then we can uh, uh, develop a drug uh, uh, from these uh, extracts. Yeah, especially confined to this oxygen consumption, that is the main reason of hypoxia nowadays. This and the inflammation. Yes. Any other questions? Um, so you you did a congratulations on your work first, uh, and then okay. so you spoke that you got a water extract, right? The aqueous extract. So before making the um, serial dilutions for finding out the EC fifty and things, how did you ensure that you got rid of the water? Like, what's the procedure you followed um, to get a dry sample? Uh, yes, after the extraction process, we do a uh, vacuum rotary evaporation uh, and uh, then we uh, concentrated our extract uh, into sterile vials. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? So, so thank you very much. Uh, Thank um, you very much. All right, we'll move to the next presentation. Our next present is uh, TIS Ruberu. Determination of durations of consistency of the antacid activity in aqueous ethanolic hexane extracts and quantitative determinations of flavonoids and polyphenols of evolvulus alcinoids. The other authors are TIS Ruberu, W J A N B N Jasuria, L D A M Arau Arauvela, T S Suresh, L Palliya Guru, and P M Jayavira. Over to you. 
Thank you very much, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Nisha Parubeiru uh, from the University of Sri Jayawa, Janakula, and I'll introduce my uh, research team. Uh, mm -hmm. Excuse me, we cannot hear you. Excuse me, we cannot hear you. Am I audible now, sir? Sound is not clear. Am I audible now, sir? So increase your volume in your computer. Now, is it okay? No. Am I audible now, sir? Okay. So, so increase the volume of the mic or come closer to, closer to the mic in your computer. Am I audible now, sir? Uh, now it's okay. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm Indrachapa Rubedu from University of Sri Java, Dhanapura. Uh, I'll introduce my research team, Dr. Banuki Jai Surya, Dr. Menuka Rao Vavala, Prof. Sugandhika Suresh, Dr. Lalinda Palyaguru, and Senior Professor Pradeep Jai uh, Our today's presentation is about the duration of consistent neutralization uh, and uh, flavonoids and polyphenol contents of evolvular assassinites. Let me share my screen. Please show your presentation to us. All right, now we can see. Huh? Uh, I hope you can see. Now we can see, right. You start restart Thank again. You. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so our presentation is about the duration of consistent neutralizing effects and uh, polyphenol and flavonoid contents of evolvular acinides. Uh, this is the plant Evolvulus acinoids, commonly known as Drop Morning Glory, Nirvishnu Kranti, or Shankpushpi. Uh, it is a perennial herb with tiny bluish color flowers. Uh, the plant has several medicinal values, such as antipyretic, anti-diabetic, antidepressant, and also gastroprotective activity. And our team is more focused about the gastroprotectivity of Nirvishnu Kranti uh, because of the proven efficacy of the plant in uh, both in vitro and in vivo studies. Uh, also, previously, we have formulated a granular dosage form and uh, uh, tuber granular dosage form and F and effervescent granular dosage form using evolvular sarsinides. Uh, in traditional treatment systems, each part of this herb is useful. Uh, for example, the decoction of the whole plant, leaf extract, and the volatile volatile oils can be mentioned. Uh, I'll quickly introduce our previous work, which is related to this presentation also. Uh, we have carried out phytochemical uh, analysis of evolved assassinites. If I elaborate a comparison of thin layer chromatography fingerprinting of aqueous, ethanolic, and hexane extracts, uh, followed by the preliminary phytochemical screening and the quantification of alkaloids, saponins, and tannins present in the plant powder. Thereafter, we uh, and assess the antacid properties, uh, which is one of the gastroprotective mechanisms. Uh, first, we qualitatively assess the neutralization on artificial gastric juice solution, which is uh, which was at point uh, pH 1.2. Uh, thereafter, we quantified these neutralizing effects uh, using four trans titration model. Uh, this was a titration method. Uh, uh, carried out using 0.1 normality hydrochloric acid to neutralize the plant samples. Uh, those are the experiments, uh, and, and with those experiments, we observed that the aqueous extract of revolvular assassinoids uh, possessed a significant antacid capacity, unlike the ethanolic and hexane extracts. Also, uh, the most 
most of the phytochemicals were present in the aqueous extract. As you can see in the chart, the alkalis, phenolics, flavonoids, tannins, saponins, and also cardiac glycosides were present in the aqueous extract. Uh, the quantity, uh, the percentage quantity of alkaloids of uh, uh, present in the plant powder was uh, higher than that of saponins or tannins. Uh, those are the findings which inspired uh, our present study, uh, which was to determine the duration of consistency of the reported antacid activity of aqueous, ethanolic, and hexane extracts, and also to uh, determine the quantities of flavonoids and polyphenols present in those extracts. These are the steps at a glance. Uh, first, we collected uh, the whole plant of revolvular salicinoids, which were at uh, flowering stage from the southern province of Sri Lanka. And then we washed, air dried them uh, for two weeks before coarsely powdered. Uh, we prepared a hot aqueous ethanolic and hexane extracts uh, using the flux method. Thereafter, we carried out the quantitative determination of flavonoids and polyphenols contained in aqueous, ethanolic, and hexane extracts. Uh, finally, we assessed the duration of consistent neutralization uh, using Vertas artificial stomach model. Uh, we used spectrometric methods uh, for this quantification. Uh, for flavonoid content, uh, we used uh, a method described by Medan et al. Uh, Medan co workers in 2005. And for total polyphenol content, we used uh, the classic uh, Pauline Kokachi spread with method. The uh, duration of consistent neutralization was determined using uh, Vertas artificial stomach model, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a picture of the apparatus we prepared. Uh, the stomach model mainly consisted of three compartments. Uh, first, artificial gastric juice reservoir, the sample, and the discarding jar. Uh, the purpose was to simulate the gastric conditions during the entire experiment uh, for the sample. Uh, therefore, we maintained the temperature at 37 degrees of Celsius, and we constantly stirred the sample. And also, uh, artificial gastric juice was pumped into the sample, and simultaneously, the contents of the sample was pumped out at a rate of three milliliters per minute, which is uh, the known secretion rate of gastric juice. Uh, we measured the time taken by the sample to reach pH of three as the uh, reading. Uh, let's look at the results. Uh, as we can see in the tables, the highest quantities of flavonoids and polyphenols were present in the ethanolic extract as acinides. The duration of consistent neutralization was uh, significant with the aqueous extracts of uh, the plant. Uh, as we can clearly see in the graph, uh, even the lowest concentration of the uh, aqueous extract, uh, which was 0 0.05 grams per milliliter, this, uh, uh, it did exhibit a uh, significant activity compared to the ethanolic and hexane extracts. For this experiment, uh, we used uh, a commercially available uh, Ayurvedic antacid preparation as the reference drug, and the distilled water uh, served as the negative control of the aqueous extract. As for the results, the highest quantities of flavonoids and polyphenols were present in the ethanolic extract, uh, whereas the aqueous extract uh, possessed uh, uh, rather lower quantities. However, it was the aqueous extract exhibited a significant duration of consistent neutralization, uh, whereas uh, the ethanolic and hexane extracts did not exhibit such potent antacid duration. Also, we could observe uh, the duration increased with the concentration of the aqueous extract. In conclusion, the aqueous extract of evolved assassinoids or Nirvishnu Kranti uh, possessed uh, potent antacid activity 
uh, therefore, uh, use of aqueous extract in Ayurvedic preparations in treatment of gastric ulcers can be supported based with these findings. And furthermore, uh, flavonoids and polyphenols may not be the factors uh, which significantly contribute to these uh, neutralizing effects or the antacid properties of aqueous extract. So we suggest uh, further studies on biotidry guided fractionation of aqueous extract uh, in order to find the gastroprotective agents present in it. Uh, with that, we've come to the end of our presentation. Uh, these are the references if you're interested in. I would like to acknowledge University of Sri, Sri Jayawardhana for funding our research and advisors for their immense support and the uh, advice. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your valuable time. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ruberu, for your excellent presentation. Uh, first, the judges now is open for questioning. So, uh, is there any singular name for this uh, plant? Yes, ma'am. It's uh, Neil Vishnu Kranti. Okay. Is it uh, the single name? Yes, ma'am. Is it uh, what you use in Sri Lanka, right? Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, and the. And also, there's a tamil as well. Okay. And uh, just uh, give me uh, some uh, description about this artificial uh, gastric environment. So here you have used uh, uh, some uh, chemicals there. Are they uh, synthetic or uh, whether they are artificially uh, extracted uh, chemicals you have used? There are two types. Out yes, of the two types, yes. Uh, they are actually artificially synthesized uh, chemicals, uh, but uh, those are for the cell culture grade chemicals, uh, it, which is the pepsin actually, the enzyme pepsin and uh, hydrochloric acid. So this pepsin should be then extracted from uh, some uh, organisms and uh, artificially produced, right? It is not synthetic then. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, that uh, your uh, study, uh, it it, uh, it is not uh, that much uh, valid. Valid if you are uh, just doing it in synthetic uh, chemicals. That's why I just want to clarify it. And uh, here you uh, mainly target about the flavonoid and polyphenol content. And uh, your final uh, conclusion is that they are not the uh, phytochemicals which uh, responsible for this antacid activity. So uh, your aqueous extract is much more uh, active. So what is the uh, phytochemical you suggest that uh, responsible for this activity? Uh, actually, uh, uh, the, we have uh, analyzed the alkaloid content extracts too in our previous studies, uh, yet uh, uh, the ethanolic extract contained a uh, more uh, percentage of these uh, phytochemicals, alkaloids, flavonoids, and polyphenols. So, uh, so far with the uh, studies, we suggest that the saponins may be like we haven't uh, we haven't planned the studies yet, but we uh, we suppose that it's it might be the uh, phytochemical constituent uh, uh, responsible for this uh, antacid property of aqueous extracts because uh, it was the most uh, uh, prominent phytochemical uh, present in the aqueous extract so far. Okay. Qualitatively, I mean, not, not quantitatively. Okay, right. Yes, uh, any, other, any other questions from the audience and the virtual audience also? We didn't get any questions. You have a chance to ask questions now, virtual audience. Let's move to the 
uh, next presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ruberu. So next presenter is uh, Mr. NRM Nelumbine. First guest complexation behavior of NS8 with beta cyclodextrin, the molecular dynamics study. And the authors are Mr. Authors are NRM Nelumbine and RJKU Pranatunga. Over to you. So it's a physical presentation in this forum. Good afternoon, everyone. Sir, thank you for your introduction. And I would like to share my research findings on host case complexation behavior of NS8 with beta psychodesting. Now, this is a uh, I can restart. We, can, we will restart. You can restart. Okay, fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present my research findings on 14th International Research Conference of KDO. And I would like to share my research findings on host case complexation behavior of NS8 with beta cyclodestrin. And uh, I'd like to tell you that this is not a wet lab experiment. Uh, we assess this uh, interaction of NS8 with uh, beta cyclodestrin computationally. This is a molecular dynamic study, which means a kind of a in silico approach. Now, let me give you some uh, introduction about cyclodestrins. Actually, uh, these are widely used uh, kind of excipients in pharmaceutical industry because uh, they can make hospice complexes by engulfing some of the drug molecules inside the cavity of cyclodestrins. These are kind of cyclic oligosaccharides with uh, one four link glucopyranose units. And basically they have a hydrophilic out layer containing hydroxyl groups. And the inner lining of the cavity is covered with hydrogen atoms and the glycosidic oxygen. And they are non-bonding electron pairs. And usually when it's come to the structure, the arrangement of glucopyranose units make them as a kind of a cone shaped molecule where you get a hollow cavity that can engulf some of the drug molecules. Now, naturally, we have alpha, beta, and gamma cyclodestrin, which consists of uh, six, seven, and eight glucopyranoid units. Now, appropriately sized molecules can be immobilized via tight but reversible associations. No permanent bonds are formed, uh, only the hydrogen bonds and also dipole dipole interaction. And some of the hydrophobic effects created by the solvent are responsible for making complexes. Psychodestins can improve the physiochemical behavior of uh, drugs and the biological properties too, uh, as solubility, stability, and uh, some other things. As an example, they are widely used to uh, mask the taste of the drug molecules and also improve the stability and the reduce the chemical reactivity and so and so. Now, when it's come to the interaction of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with beta psychodestrin. Now, when it are widely used group of medicines to treat fever, pain, and inflammation. Now, some of these NS8s are in the market that are combined with this excipient, beta psychodestrin. Some are in the formulation stage even. Now, host case interactions are one of the most efficient ways to deliver NSAIDs by modulating their toxicological and chemical properties. They contain both hydrophobic and hydrophilic moieties, and thus they are potentially suitable for inclusion as case with psychodestrin. So that is why we were interested on looking at their complex in behavior. Now the scope of the problem, now when it's come to the psychodestrin based formulations, they are mainly developed through trial and error approach. The formulation scientists need to spend a lot of time and also money on the formulation stage of these medicines. Now usually, you know, to develop a drug, you need at least 10 to 15 years of time. But if you assess the complex in behavior or 
without using wet lab experiments. You can minimize that time frame. And also, traditionally, the cyclodestrin cavity is considered to be hydrophobic. But is it? It's a question because uh, there are some recent findings showing some, uh, uh, you know, uh, the cavity is not so hydrophobic. It's just a debate, uh, but it has a kind of a relatively intermediate nature, like a ethanolic solution. So we try to assess that in our study too. And it is believed that the size and the functional groups of the gas molecule determine the complexation. There are some experimental evidences, but they, uh, even though the evidence are there, but it is still lacking, or even uh, the available ones need some validations. These are the objectives of our study to develop a novel computational methodology, which is a molecular dynamic approach to understand the complexation behavior of NSAs with beta cyclodestrin. And our specific objectives were to identify the stable conformations of NSAs and the beta cyclodestrin complexes, and then to identify the important anchoring groups or the atoms which will stabilize the complexes. And finally, validate the newly developed method and to check its reproducibility uh, comparison to the experimental findings that are already available. Now, throughout the research, we use uh, molecular dynamics simulations. These are numerical computer simulations based on classical mechanics, where the movements of molecules are calculated with respect to time. In the right side, you can see the behavior of ibuprofen within the cyclodestrin cavity. Now, these uh, molecular dynamic simulations allows understand the equilibrium and the dynamic behavior of molecules, including their conformational changes. They have to predict the qualitative changes of a process by changing different parameters that cannot be tested experimentally. So that even you can see the uh, macroscopic changes in wet lab experiments, but the microscopic changes can be seen with computational experiments. In this research, we use all atom simulations using NAMD 2.1 molecular dynamic code, that is the software we use, and also with the aid of CHAM 36 force field. These are the drugs that we have selected. We use ketoprofen, ibuprofen, diclofenac, meloxicam, acetaminophen, or paracetamol, aspirin, naproxen, pyrosecam, and indomethacin. We have choose these drug molecules to represent, uh, you know, various molecular weights, structures, and the hydrophobicities. And this is the novel method we use. Now, most of the previous uh, findings were based on docking studies. And also, some were used. These uh, complexes, uh, actually, they have uh, formed the complexes manually. But here, we use a random approach, which means uh, we automate the complexation process. Now, actually, uh, we, we randomly rotate the drug molecule into uh, 50 different co conformations. And then uh, we did 1,000 translations for each of the uh, rotation, which means 50,000 different confirmations were created. And from that, we have selected 50 different confirmations by looking at the difference in the center of mass of the psychodestin and the drug molecule. And then we simulate them. And in the analysis, we first check the association energy. We were so interested on that because uh, by looking at the energy difference, you can see whether the complexation process is favorable or not. If you get a, a minus value, which means a negative value, which means the association is favorable. So we use MMPBSA method, which means molecular mechanics with the Poisson's Boltzmann surface area. You can uh, take the association energy. Uh, you can calculate the association energy by taking the difference of the energy of the complex and the drug and psychodestrin. And then to check the fitness of the molecule to the cavity, which means if the, if the drug molecule is going to properly fit into the cavity, we check the solvent accessible surface area. Then finally, we come up with contact analysis and also we made some contact maps of the drug molecules to identify the groups that are in the psychodestrin cavity. Moving to the results. Now, as I told you, more negative energy difference indicate more stable complexation. Now, as you can see in the graph, naproxen, and indomethacin ibuprofen shows the largest energy difference, making stable complexes, whereas pyrosecam comparatively shows least energy change. However, interestingly, the least energy confirmation is not the most abundant form of the complexes. The reason is, uh, as you can see in this, uh, the 
trajectory that I showed you, the mo drug molecule can easily rotate within the cavity, which means it can have multiple conformations so that it will have average energy conformation rather than moving into the lowest energy value. Now, here you can see the, all the nine drug complexes with their average energy conformation in the right corner. You can see uh, right top corner, you can see the lowest energy conformation, average energy conformation, and the highest energy conformation of ibuprofen and the beta cyclodestrin. Then, when it comes to solon accessible surface area, align with the result that we got in the uh, uh, energy calculation. Indomethacin, ibuprofen, pyrocecam, and naproxen shows the lowest values, which means they are properly fit into the cavity of beta cyclodestrin. And then uh, in this figure, you can see the inclusion parts of the drug molecules, and the red colors atoms are the ones that are in contact with beta cyclodestrin. Now, as you can see, even though some relatively hydrophobic components of the drug molecules are included in the cavity, but uh, the drug molecules do make, I mean, they contact uh, uh, with the psychodesting using hydro, you know, kind of electronegative atoms, especially oxygen, chlorine, and sulfur, which means to stabilize the complexes, it is clear that the dipole dipole interactions and also the hydrogen bondings are so important, um, so, which means the cavity is not so hydrophobic, but rather having a kind of an intermediate nature. And to validate our result, then we checked. Uh, uh, the result that we obtained in the molecular dynamic study with the already available experimental findings. As you can see, uh, the, the areas that we have identified as the inclusion areas of the drugs uh, that were confirmed by the C13 NMR, H1 NMR, and the FTIR measurements and these findings. So, which means our the, the, the newly developed method is reproducible and provides some accurate results in the pre, I mean, that can be used in the preclinical stage. In the drug development. These are the conclusions. The study confirmed that the cavity is not so hydrophobic, but rather having intermediate nature. The developed novel method produced comparable result with the experimental findings. The contacting atoms of drug molecules with the psychodesting are electronegative ones, including oxygen, chlorine, and sulfur. The presence of anchoring groups or the atoms are important for stable complexes. And drug molecules can freely rotate within the beta psychodesting and not remain in their lowest energy conformation, but rather have average energy range. And naproxen, indomethacin, ibuprofen shows largest energy difference, making more stable complexes. These are the references that we followed, some of them. And I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. RJ K. U. Ranatunga, and also I would like to mention the financial support that I got from University of Peradeniya. And special thanks go to Dr. Steven Nizan and Dr. Dinar Ranatunga from University of Texas, Dallas, USA. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for Ms. Nilumdinia for informative presentation. Now this is open first for the judges. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would uh, like to ask you that here you have a uh, uh, observe for the uh, search for the stability yeah here. only stability right so as you said there are there can be many confirmations yes so uh, in your study you have uh, selected most uh, stable confirmations or uh, is there is a pool or you have selected some uh, confirmation yeah, actually there's a pool i, I mean uh, there's a pool which means uh, now we gave, got around I, I told you that uh, we selected 50000 different confirmations and then mm -hmm. we select uh, come up with 50 different confirmations most suitable ones and then we simulate them and once you look at the trajectory you can cluster them mm -hmm. now the average energy confirmations are the ones that, that you can uh, move the large number of frames or the similar more similar confirmation into a pool in the average confirmation even you can't see a single stage but you get uh, you know with minor differences, but you can cluster them. Uh, now, in the uh, lowest energy and the highest energy, you get around 20%, uh, like 20%, but 60 to 70% cluster mm -hmm. is in these average confirmations. Okay. And uh, the other thing is that here, uh, when you are uh, 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 that uh, observing these things, are you uh, considering any factors uh, regarding uh, passage through biological barriers 
or targeting uh, molecules in the body like that? Uh, uh, can you introduce uh, those uh, factors into these uh, um, molecules in silico? Yeah, of course. Uh, we can use uh, molecular docking for that. Now here also we can, uh, you know, uh, improve. I mean, uh, we can go into another stage now. When it comes to this beta cycle testing and drug complexes, most are we use in the oral formulations. Now we can think about uh, once you combine these uh, NSAIDs with the uh, with the uh, beta cycle and how they interact with the uh, proteins in the GI tract, how they you know try to adhere into the proteins, transport proteins and things. But for that, actually, we need a lot of computational power. Actually, for this research, even we had to take the support of uh, USA computer cluster yeah because we don't have that facilities we need supercomputer for that so in sri lanka we don't have that uh, uh, yeah i mean we can but it took a lot of time now for this uh, we ran simulation for two nanosecond it took two weeks right but in the usa it was only four days we got the result if, so if you go for the docking and you mean it's a huge lot of time yeah. and uh, all of them are in a nanoscale right uh, yeah nanoscale yeah so it is more or less uh, a nanotechnological uh, assay then? Uh, yes, yes. And the uh, other thing uh, that, uh, is there any literature or any uh, studies that have been used uh, in uh, natural product in this way that uh, in molecular? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So you can, uh, as example, even from a ecosystem track that if you can uh, identify the, 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 the compound there, right, uh, then you can check the interaction of that compound with the, with the proteins or mm. maybe the excipients or whatever mm. you can artificially create the environment and then you can simulate it because uh, most of the computer simulations are now in a very high standard they can produce a lot of data mm. even the bioinformatics you can use yeah. the data so that is why you know even this covid situation now usually you took i told you that uh, 10 to 15 years are needed to develop a drug but we come up with vaccines within two years but still they are they are not you know uh, you know we don't know the except a whole lot of information but still we can test the drug on humans because because uh, we come up with these computational experiments that's right yeah. okay thank you then. sometimes the uh, animal studies can be replaced do you think yeah pre clinical that... studies okay. so that means uh, we have a uh, uh, we have some hopes in future then. Yeah, a lot of okay. debate is going on the animal testing, so. <laughs> okay, thank you, then interesting you. study. Mr. Ramesh, I have some question. Uh, so this is a very good area to, now we have to look in at because in, in silico, uh, drug design and uh, molecular designs and also those field is rapidly expanding because of the most of the because of its uh, usability is higher in the pre-formulation stage. Yeah. So we all know that circular dextrin as a, we can use as an excipient and also the, as a drug delivery system. Yeah. So in this case, you use that uh, NSIDS basically uh, as a guest molecule. So in this uh, context, so basically uh, that you already show demonstrate here that the stability of the complex they are generating so if we are going to use cyclodexin as a drug delivery system so basically for the any type of the macro or the micro molecules and so then uh, what is the chance and uh, uh, what are the chances to that we can prepare the uh, we can achieve the desire uh, the drug release rate uh, so what we can do, which type of manipulation we can do with that molecules, basically? So, yeah, basically by making Hoskes interactions, you can increase the solubility of the drug yeah, molecules. Yeah, because there's a, outside of the cavities consist of a lot of hydroxyl groups. So that uh, if there are, you know, uh, uh, drugs which, which, uh, which do not dissolve easily, so you can uh, put it into these uh, psychodestrin and uh, make them more soluble. So, so I think that your technique, which you are you already designed here and already modified, so I think it is very useful for the uh, pre-formulation stage drug design. Yes, yeah, so we so can get the uh, more idea about the solubility. Because since now we have some idea about the functional groups here, yeah. so that uh, you know we don't need to test all the drug molecules in the pre-formulation stage. We can use this as a guide, and uh, yeah, we can go forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I uh, 
but I understood this, you have two challenges. The first one is the is hydrophobic or hydrophilic matter. Yeah. The second one is this confirmation matter. So this uh, as a solution for this hydrophobic hydrophilic one. So you can use the you know for continuing this research, you can go to the either normal phase for the hydrophilic one, the normal phase chromatography, the hydrophobic one you can target with the reverse phase chromatography and get the idea of this molecule real which part which which is confined to the whether hydrophilic or hydrophobic okay. that part. And for the for the binding, you can go to the this uh, the ribbon cartoons, ribbon cartoon structures and protein protein interactions. Interaction. So these are freely available. You don't need to buy them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for yeah, a certain extent, problems. you can have this experimental in, in such way. Because this is a drug designing one, it's a very important research if you continue. Yeah. Thank you, Other questions? Okay. Right, any other questions from the virtual audience? So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Aya. Sir, yes, I ask, yeah, ask, ask your question, please. So actually it's so interesting for uh, uh, researchers. Uh, so I would like to ask, uh, is there enough facilities in Sri Lanka or in locally uh, to engage with this uh, in silico uh, studies? Because we have learned about them in medicinal chemistry also. Uh, do we have enough facilities to uh, uh, undergo such uh, uh, studies in our researchers or in software also? Resources means actually you can go up to maybe a uh maybe 20 nanosecond maximally but uh, to uh, you know validate your findings at least you have to come into like one microsecond maybe so uh, for that the existing resources are actually not enough but obviously if you can uh, you know collaborate with a foreign university i think it's possible because even now you can uh, get the distance access and you can submit your your, your dynamic simulations to, to clusters available in other universities. But there, there are researchers, there are researchers in uh, uh, University of Peradiniya, Colombo, and also University of Javadanapura. And uh, you can do a study, uh, uh, but with the current, uh, you know, I, I'm not talking about these uh, big studies about, you know, the stage of drug development, but uh, for that, you need a lot of, you know, computational power, but we don't have, as a country, we don't have such facilities. But if you can, uh, you know, get the support of other universities, maybe uh, as, a, as a collaboration, it's possible. But the researchers are here. Yeah, he, he, they have a lot of uh, contacts with the foreign universities, and you can go ahead, no issue. Thank you, sir. Actually, you can uh, target the IBB, the Molecular Biology and Biochemistry uh, yeah. University of Colombo. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation thank you, and we'll move to the next. And the next present is RHMPD Mother Hasa. Mother Hasa. So, yeah, the topic is quality and in vitro equivalence testing of chloroquine phosphate 250 milligram USD tablets in Sri Lanka. Uh, the authors are RHMPD Madhasa, SM SR Vijay Ratna, UPGS Udugoda, uh, MRM Melum Denian, BMR Fernando Pulle. Over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by introducing myself. My name is Rilmi Madhahasa and this is our undergraduate research project. The topic of our research is quality and in vitro equivalence testing of chloroquine phosphate 250 milligram USB tablets in Sri Lanka. The main concern of our study was quality and in vitro equivalence. According to the United States 
Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency. It is essential to conduct quality control studies and bioequivalence studies to allow drugs for interchangeability. FDA has legalized all the medicines, including generics and brands, which used by human should have standards. According to the standards, a product must satisfy the monograph requirements for quality, safety, and efficacy. So basically testing physical parameters that are mentioned in pharmacopoeia has paramount importance in ensuring quality, safety, efficacy of medicines. And also in vitro dissolution testing can be done can be a valuable predictor instead of expensive in vivo bioavailability and bioequivalence. So, so bioequivalence study is a mandatory requirement to minimize the consequences of the interchangeability between generic and innovator products. It gives useful information that helps for the rational use of medicines through having a generic or innovative product for a purpose. US FDA defines bioequivalence studies as the absence of a significant difference in the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety in pharmaceutical equivalents or pharmaceutical alternatives becomes available at the site of drug action when administered at the same molar dose under similar conditions in an appropriately designed study. This figure shows the biopharmaceutical classification system. It is a system that differentiates drugs on the basis of their solubility and permeability. There have been certain requirements for a bioweb study. The drugs should have high solubility and high permeability according to the BCS. Requirements for a BCS-based bioweaver study includes dissolution tests include dissolution tests done in three different pH media, pH 1.2, 4.5, and 6.8. Since in vivo bioequivalence testings are time consuming and expensive, we had to go for a in vivo bioequivalence testing adhering to the BioWave criteria. So the chloroquine is classified as eligible for the BioWave by the WHO based on its biopharmaceutical classification. As an additional information, we have gathered some cost related data, and I'll be talking about that in upcoming slides. Even though Sri Lanka has been declared as malaria-free country by WHO, there were some cases reported time to time in Sri Lanka. The anti-malaria campaign of Sri Lanka is still using the imported chloroquine phosphate tablets from India. Recently, State Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Corporation has restarted manufacturing chloroquine phosphate for the treatment of malaria and for the potential use of it during COVID-19 pandemic. However, the generic product manufactured by the SPNC has not undergone the bioequivalent testing to confirm the bioequivalence with an either a product registered with the stringent regulatory authority or with the innovator. Therefore, it is time we need to prove that the generic chloroquine phosphate manufactured in Sri Lanka satisfy the WHO criteria for interchangeability with the innovator or a product registered under a stringent regulatory authority. And further, it will help to reduce the national expenditure in importing this drug and support the government protocol on producing national medicine requirement within the country. This is the main objective of our study. The objective was our study was to check the interchangeability of generic SPNC chloroquine for with the WHO pre-qualified product using the US FDA specifications and WHO methodological acceptance of a biowave. This is the method that we conduct that we use to conduct our project. Three different batches from chloroquine phosphate 250 mg USP tablets manufactured by State Pharmaceutical Manufacturer Corporation and one batch of WHO pre-qualified chloroquine phosphate 200 mg USP tablets from anti malarian campaign in Sri Lanka were selected. All samples were an analyzed as per the requirement mentioned in USP and also the comparative dissolution profiles were obtained to check the in vitro equivalence. These are the quality tests that we performed as per USP uniformity of weight, friability, hardness, disintegration, dissolution, assay, 
and comparative dissolution profile. For the uniformity of weight, the acceptable weight range should be within 7.5 as a percentage deviation. For friability, weight loss should not be no more than 1%. For the hardness test, hardness limit should be in the range of 50 Newton to 100 Newton. For the disintegration test, all the dosage units should be disintegrated completely within 30 minutes. At least 75 of the active substance should be released within 45 minutes to pass the dissolution test. For the assay test, the reference range should be between 93% to 107%. For the comparative dissolution profiles, it should be done in a three different pH media, pH 1.2, 4.5, and 6.8 for the analysis of equivalence under BCS based bioavailable conditions. These are the results of uniformity of weight, friability, disintegration, and hardness. As you can see in this table, all four batches pass the weight variation, friability, disintegration, dissolution, and assay as per the specifications of WB of USP. The hardness test was only passed by the WHO pre-codified product. This is the table that shows the results of comparative dissolution profiles. And if you take a closer look at this, the blue line, which represents the WHO pre-qualified chloroquine phosphate, shows lower dissolution profiles than locally manufactured chloroquine phosphate. All four batches complied with USP specifications by disintegrating all the dosage units completely within 30 minutes. In the comparison of dissolution results, the locally produced generic product shows the highest standard of quality plus in vitro equivalents that support bioavailable conditions. The assay test was done in two different USP methods, which are HPLC and extraction. The results from both methods were in the reference range. All the tablets analyzed in the study passed the assay according to the USP specifications. So coming into conclusions, according to the result obtained, all the badges were in good quality. Difference product from antimalarial campaign has passed all the tests, including the weight variation, friability, hardness, disintegration, dissolution, and assay. The only problem was SPMC samples have failed to pass the hardness test. But the hardness test is not a mandatory test for the quality evaluation if they pass other quality control tests. When it comes to bioequivalence, SPMC products have get greater compliance with the dissolution profiles than the reference products. SPMC product have showed the maximum percentage release of chloroquine phosphate against time in pH 1.2, 4.5, and 6.8. Not only the dissolution profiles, SPMC products have better uniformity of content than the reference product as assessed by the assay test. When looking at the cost-related data, the imported chloroquine phosphate from antimalarial campaign has a high quoted unit price of approximately 450 rupees. But locally manufactured chloroquine phosphate is only 2 rupees and 19 cents in 2020. Hence, the annual antimalarial campaign medicines expenditure will be reduced by a larger amount and save valuable foreign exchange. The limitation of our study was there were only one batch of WHO pre-qualified chloroquine phosphate available at antimalarial campaign due to the current pandemic. So we would suggest that it is better to do further analysis using more batches. So we can conclude that chloroquine phosphate tablet, tablets produced by State Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Corporation are equivalent to the already available WHO pre-qualified product at antimalarial campaign in terms of quality and bioequivalence, and further, it is cost-effective. These are the references that we use, and we would like to wish, express our sincere appreciation to our supervisor, Senior Professor Omni Fernand Pulle, and our co-supervisor, Mr. Umesh Nerundenia, and the director of antimalarial campaign, Dr. Prasad Ranavira. 
and the, all the members of SPNC and to the listeners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the important presentation of uh, Ms. Matahasa. Now this is open for the questioning, just the, uh, as usual, the judges. First of all, I would like to know what is the prevalence of malaria at the moment in Sri Lanka? Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, madam, uh, there are some cases, little cases, but not too much. Uh, we're reporting in Sri Lanka, as we got to know. Okay. Uh, so now it is uh, actually eradicated, but uh, we can see uh, some uh, uh, several cases here and there. Yes. Okay, that's it. Uh, and I would like to know why you have selected three batches from uh, Sri Lankan uh, production and one batch from WHO uh, recognized uh, product. Yes, first of all, madam, the innovator product is not available in Sri Lanka. And the due to the current pandemic, uh, the anti malarial campaign had only one batch only small quantity of only one batch from this product, imported product. So we had to go for that situation. Okay, at least uh, did you uh, carry out this experiment in triplicates? Yes, madam. And uh, you said that hardness is uh, low in uh, local product. So is there any suggestion that uh, why the hardness is low? And uh, do you have any suggestions to improve hardness? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, the hardness is because uh, when the compressing the tablet, uh, then we, they can use uh, more uh, more technical te technologies to improve the the te technology. And uh, but I think it is not mandatory when comparing the quality. Hardness is a not mandate, not a mandatory test. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, I have a question to ask from you. Uh, that you told about the, uh, you already observed that there is a hardness problem in the SPMC product. Yes. So, and you demonstrate in the last mm -hmm. conclusions about the, uh, that cost for the imported drugs and also in the Sri Lankan manufacturing drug. So I think in the basic problem is here in the, with the formulation. So I, that's there is no pro, uh, no things to do in your side so in yeah. i uh, basically i like to ask you this is this type of the research have to be done in sri lanka because uh, we have to improve our quality of our own production so yeah. and we have to find out what is the basic problems in our manufacturing area so i think uh, and in here is about the chloroquine. The raw material is the main problem. I think, uh, how, what do you think and uh, which uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredients quality of the SPMC and the imported drugs, it's okay. Uh, you did some kind of the analysis to compare both uh, two uh, materials. So about the active pharmaceutical ingredients, not the final products. So basically about the Yes, sir. we have done. We have prepared uh, standard solutions for uh, both samples, comparing the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient. Yeah, I think it's a basic problem with the formulations about the hardness because uh, they are using not that much material excipients uh, like uh, uh, imported drug. Uh, so this is a good good research, and uh, in particular thing we have to do. And I encourage like this work. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions? Any questions from you? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Madhahasa. Now, thank you, sir. Yeah, we move to, move to the last presentation of the, today and the last presentation of this uh, LIDL sessions I see. The presenter is uh, Ms. BLC Samanmali. The title is Photoprotective and antioxidant activities of leaf, fruit, and seed extracts of Cyanometra polyflora, the comparative study. The authors are BLC Samanmani, 
RN Patirana and HICDC over to you. Thank you, sir. Let me share the presentation with you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Chadurika Lianagi. I am here to pre present the findings of my research, photoprotective and antioxidant activities of leaf, fruit, and seed extracts of Spinometra cauliflora, a comparative study. So the, this is the content of my presentation. First of all, let me give you a brief introduction regarding the research. Overexposure to UV radiation causes harmful effects in human body. Therefore, it's necessary to apply a sun protective cream to protect our skin from harmful radiation. There are different form phytochemical uh, sunscreen preparations available in the market. There are different sunscreen preparations available in the market, but Synthetic sunscreen preparations cause harmful side effects such as erythema, uh, contact dermatitis, and then kind of rosaceae and estrogenicity. Likewise, there are unwanted side effects associated with synthetic sunscreen preparations. Okay. Therefore, nowadays, there is a big demand for safe, effective herbal sunscreen preparations. Studies have reported that secondary metabolites exhibit antioxidant properties. In this research, an attempt was made to determine the sun protection factor and antioxidant activity of the plant Cyanometra cauliflora, namely in same color. Uh, this plant is known as Namina or Nangnan. You can see here the images of the plant, leaves, fruits, and flowers. The various plants Parts of this plant are used in traditional medicine to treat different ailments, but comparative studies are unavailable for sun protection activity and the antioxidant activity of this plant. So these are the objectives of this study to determine the sun protection factor of different plant parts of Sanometra cauliflora and to evaluate the antioxidant activity using two methods namely total phenolic content assay and DPPH radical scavenging activity assays and to analyze the correlation between sun protection factor and antioxidant activity. Let me briefly explain you the methodology section. So prior to the study, the plant was identified and authenticated. As I mentioned previously, different plant parts were used, unripe fruits, ripe fruits, mature leaves and seeds. In the preparation of methanolic plant extracts, the clean plant parts were used and they were cut into small pieces and air dried, then powdered and sealed. So these powdered samples were ultrasonicated at room temperature for 30 minutes, taking methanol as the solvents. Then the filtrates were subjected to rotary operation and freeze drying to remove the solvent and to obtain the final products. So the final products are labeled as shown in this table. CUF denotes cyanometra unripe fruit, CRF cyanometra ripe fruit, CS, cyanometra seeds, and CML, cyanometra mature leaves. As a characterization step, UV visible spectra of all the plant extracts were obtained from 200 nanometer to 700 nanometer UV range okay, in order to analyze any pattern of absorbance. Photoprotective activity of the extracts were determined in terms of sun protection factor, which is a numerical measurement of the extent of protection of our skin from the UVB rays by sunscreens. Here I used a simple in vitro technique. In this methodology, plant extracts and the reference drug dermatone were dissolved to prepare 0.2 milligram per ml concentration solutions and then the absorbance values of these solutions were taken spectrophotometrically from 290 to 320 nanometer wavelength at 5 nanometer intervals. So the SPF values were calculated using the Manse equation. Plant extract which exhibited the highest SPF value was further analyzed taking 
a concentration series. So here, this is the Mansi equation used in this study. Antioxidant activity of the plant extracts were calculated and measured using two assays, namely total phenolic content assay and the DPPH radical scavenging activity assay. In the total phenolic content assay, gallic acid was used as the standard. Here, the yellow color of polyn CO culture region converts its color to blue color in the presence of phenolic compounds. This color change, the intensity of this blue correlation was measured spectrophotometrically at 765 nanometer. So from the standard curve obtained from for the gallic we acid. Hear. We cannot hear you. Okay. Sorry, sir. Can, can you hear me now? No, we can hear you. Yes. Explain. Okay, from this standard curve obtained for the gallic acid, total phenolic contents of all the extracts were calculated at milligram gallic acid equivalents per gram of extract. So in the DPPH scavenging assay, ascorbic acid was used as the standard. Here in the presence of a phenolic compounds, the DPPH solution turns its color then, uh, from purple. You. Uh, you are in the DP. PH radical scavenging assay. That's like yes, sir. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Okay. On and off only we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the DPPH radical scavenging assay, the ascorbic acid was used as the standard. So here. Uh, the color of the DPA solution, that is purple color, is changed to yellow color in the presence of phenolic compounds. That change in the color was determined spectrophotometrically by taking the absorbance at 517 nanometer. Then the percentage radical scavenging activity of each concentration was calculated using this equation. So where A is the absorbance of the sample at concentration and B is the absorbance of the control from the percentage radical scavenging activity versus log concentration graphs, half maximal inhibitor concentration value. So IC50 values of the extracts were calculated and statistical analysis was performed using SPSS and Microsoft Excel software. All the experiments were carried out in triplicate and data were presented as mean plus or minus the standard error of mean. Uh, in the correlation analysis, Pearson's correlation coefficient was used. Let me briefly explain you the results and analysis section. So here in this slide, you can see the spectra, your visible spectra of all the extracts. So all the extracts showed uh, prominent peaks in the UV range. So, uh, here in determination of sun protection factor, you can see the uh, graph. This is the graphical representation of SPF values of 0.2 milligram per ml extracts of cyanometra coliflora. So according to this figure, so all the extracts exhibited um, low values compared to the reference drug dermatone. However, cyanometra maturely has exhibited the highest uh, sun protection factor values compared to other extracts. The next uh, cyanometra seeds, and the lowest value was observed with cyanometra ripe fruit. So as I mentioned previously, uh, the extract which shows the highest activity was further analyzed taking concentration series. So the cyanometra mature leaves exhibited a dose dependent uh, sun protection factor value. So it showed the highest SPF value that is 28.41 at 0.5 milligram per ml concentration. Let's move on to the results of total phenolic content assay. Uh, this is the graph of absorbance versus concentration. That is actually the standard curve of gallic acid, which was used to for the quantification of total phenolic contents of the extracts. So, um, so here you can see the total phenolic contents. Um, the results are, uh, it has various results ranging from 24.78 to 362.5. Cyanometra mature leaves. Uh, showed a 
highest phenolic content. Okay, so we can, uh, from the results, we can say that the phenolic, con uh, phenolic contents are bits extracted from cyanamide from mature leaves. These are the graphs of percentage scavenging activity versus log concentration obtained for DPPH radical scavenging assays. So from the graphs, IC50 values were obtained. So the obtained IC50 values are depicted in this table. So, so lowest IC50 value means that represents the higher DPPH radical scavenging activity. So according to that, ascorbic acid shows the highest DPPH radical scavenging activity among the extracts, the cyanometra mature leaves exhibited the highest DPPH radical scavenging activity value. The lowest activity value was um, observed with cyanometra ripe fruit. So in the analysis of correlation, so SPF and total phenolic content and SPF and DPPH radical scavenging activity exhibited a strong positive correlation when uh, compared at 10% significant level. These are my conclusions. Methanolic extract of the mature leaves of cyanometra polyflora exhibits highest SPF value. According to the results, the overall order of sunscreening activity is cyanometra mature leaves, then cyanometra seeds, next cyanometra unripe fruit, finally cyanometra ripe fruit. High concentrations of the cyanometra mature leaves extract show promising sun protecting activity. Therefore, there is a possibility to develop this extract as a topical sunscreen formulation. Methanolic leaf and seed extracts of this plant possess marked antioxidant activity. Sun protection activity may be mediated by the antioxidants. However, further results are Further studies are required to confirm this. So these are the references. So I would like to extend my gratitude to my uh, supervisors, Senior Professor Arin Patirana and uh, Senior Lecturer Ireshika Adi Silva. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I would like to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Saman Mandi. Now this is open for the judges first. So uh, I would like to know what is your uh, driving force to uh, select this plant for this uh, study? Why you have selected this particular plant? This Cyanometra cauliflora is a tropical plant uh, which can grow under uh, high sunlight conditions. Therefore, we assume that this plant may contain phytochemicals which may protect the plant from uh, High sun, um, high sun rays, UV rays. Okay, that uh, you haven't uh, included uh, bark, right? No. Bark of the plant. And uh, what is your sampling, uh, sample collection? From where you have collected uh, these samples and how many trees you have? Uh, the samples were collected from a part of the area of the Kalkara district. Uh, all the samples were collected from one plant. So the, here we used uh, seeds, unripe fruits, ripe fruits and leaves. So these uh, fruits were selected based on their size and the color. Uh, for example, ripe fruits were selected based on uh, usually more than 75% of the fruits should be Mm, yellow in color and the mm, weight should be more than 25%. Likewise, we selected uh, unripe, unripe fruits. Mm, the unripe fruits should be dark green in color and their weight should be 10 to 15 grams, the range. Likewise, we selected uh, all the plant parts from uh, one plant. Okay. And uh, I would like to make one correction that uh, you have uh, categorized total phenolic content under antioxidant assay. Actually, it is not an antioxidant assay. Antioxidant assays are yes, just- Yes, actually, uh, according to different literature, just, uh, if you refer a different assay uh, from the um, antioxidant assay, but, but uh, some literature that categorizes antioxidant assay into a uh, into the same category. That means uh, total phenolic content as an antioxidant assay because uh, there are uh, studies found that there's a correlation between antioxidant and 
antioxidants yeah. and yeah that is what I, I just want to tell you that uh, antioxidant assays are just to find what are the mechanisms and in order to find the correlation between the uh, content of phytochemicals and the antioxidant activity we are doing that right that is why it is coming under uh, it is categorized under them but uh, don't yeah. yeah don't take it yeah. as an antioxidant assay right um yeah because i think um, so the most of the researchers they categorize this uh, total phenolic content as antioxidant assay because it, its mechanism involves single electron transfer because antioxidant assays may mainly be categorized based on uh, their mechanisms like single electron transfer and hydrogen atom transfer methods so this uh, total phenolic assay we uh, categorized under that single electron transfer method, method whereas this dpph uh, radical scavenging assay we categorize as uh, hydrogen transfer assay okay and the other one is uh, dose uh, you said that uh, spf uh, uh, value is dose dependent. Uh, how you have uh, determined whether it is dose dependent? Uh -huh. Because uh, so um, I uh, used a concentration series for that, uh, um, starting from low concentration to high concentration, and then uh, um, the SPF values were calculated, and those calculated SPF values were analyzed. Actually, uh, the linearity was observed. Okay, of all the uh, samples, because uh, uh, I used only the uh, results which which fall under linear range of the uh, spectrum. Okay, right. Then, uh, then uh, you have to mention the R squared value for that. Yes. Uh, okay, then thank you. Thank you. Mr. Durega, I have one question to ask. Uh, that uh, what do you think? Uh, how the geographical factors affect to the that antioxidant activity of the uh, plant? So I mean that it can be changed according to the geographical conditions and the factors because it is yes. related to the phytochemical composition of the leaves. Uh, yes, uh, yes, actually. So uh, geographical conditions to, greatly. Uh, do you try to do some kind of research? about the collecting samples from the different areas in the Sri Lanka? Or... Uh, not actually. I know that uh, geographical conditions greatly affect the phytochemical constituents of the plant con uh, the, uh, content of the plant. Okay, extent of phytochemicals present in a plant. Therefore, that's why we selected uh, our samples from one plant only and from one area. Actually, we didn't do studies using uh, plants from different areas, different geographical conditions. It's okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, any questions from the audience, virtual audience? I have a question, madam. Yes. Uh, it, it was a very fascinating study to uh, learn of, not anything that we usually hear. So I was wondering uh, that when I have heard about sunscreens, I have heard about two types, chemical and physical. Uh, yes. Which type of sunscreen will the mature leaf extract act as? A chemical barrier or a physical? How will it act? So it acts as a physical barrier, actually. You know, sunscreen preparations uh, can be divided into two categories as physical and chemi chemical. Other thing is uh, inorganic and organic uh, sunscreen agents, because yeah, inorganic agents give a physical barrier, like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Uh, uh, if you apply those uh, sunscreen agents on the skin, that will not absorb sunlight, that will scatter sunlight, okay? reflect sunlight. Okay, so that uh, because of that, these inorganic agents or physical barriers, physical uh, uh, sun protective agents, when we apply on the skin, they form a white color scum on the skin. Okay, so they are opaque in color, so their use acceptability is lower. But when it comes to organic sunscreen preparations, they absorb UV radiation. Okay, so uh, in our study, we are analyzing herbal plants. So herbal plants contain phytochemicals like phenols. Okay, so these phenolic compounds can absorb UV light. Okay, not only phenolic compounds, there can be other compounds which can absorb UV light and uh, prevent the UV light from penetration into the skin. Okay, so that uh, we assume that these kind of organic compounds are present in our plants, which shows uh, UV absorption because we know most of uh, there are most of phy phytochemicals which have um, double bonds and uh, ph many functional groups. Which because of that, uh, these compounds are chromophores. They have chromophores which can absorb UV light. So, 
we assume that theory here there. Thank you for the answer, madam. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any questions? No, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Saman Mali. And that yeah. concludes the session. And to sum up this session, so at, at the beginning of this session, we started with this e library system. This e library system, actually, what I feel is more studies to be done in this area. Next, uh, next we move to the herbal plants and then the properties of these antibacterial and the properties of antibacterial and anti-inflammatory anti-inflammatory conditions and then next presenter we move to the anti-acid properties in herbal plants and all these plants have these antioxidative properties and it's it's vital for the nowadays the common diabetes mellitus and cancers and other autoimmune diseases to treat and then we move to the another, another area in this uh, session, this molecular docking and molecular docking and the binding of these drugs to the, uh, the, the proteins or receptors. So, uh, and we discussed the problem, we, we extensively discussed the problems of this binding of these drugs and, and we had a lot of suggestions. And next, we did this quality testing. The quality testing of this, uh, uh, this drug that is very important, very hot topic in KDU at the moment with the KDU KR. Now they have these bioequivalence studies. Now they are it's a hot topic. And finally, we, we move to this seed and again, these antioxidant activities. And overall, what I can see is so it is a, we, we created a research forum. Hmm? These are a lot of, most of them are the screening studies. And what I suggest you to get together and have a comprehensive research as research groups. Uh, because these anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and these anti-acidic drugs are very important these days. We discuss a lot. And the Sri Lanka, the other one, the Sri Lanka, the, because we have the sun in 365 days, right? the daytime 12 hours daytime and the plants are readily available we don't have winter in sri lanka plenty of plants are available and then therefore i so i ask you to i request you to continue this research with the as a groups as groups and try to get try to get good findings than this right these are screening most of the things and the comments made by the judges the judge panel and then all these things we made to improve you, improve your the quality of your presentations and improve your future. Uh, so I, so I'm honored of these our, our judges and their comments and a the, lot of questions have been asked from the audience. Finally, I must say it's a very fruitful session at the end of this IRC 2021. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for moderating this session into a fruitful one. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the end of the technical session three of Allied Health Science Sessions of 14th International Research Conference of KDU. Before winding up the session, I would like to invite the chairperson of the session, Dr. Darshana Kotahachi, to present the memento as a token of our appreciation to our judges of the session as a gratitude to their contribution made to success this event. First, I would like to invite Dr. H. M. A. J. Halhakon. Thank you very much for your kind contribution.
And then I would like to invite Dr. KDKP Kumari. Thank you, Madam, for your contribution. Thank you, sir, and please remain on the stage. Now, I would like to invite senior lecturer and head of the Department of Basic Sciences, Mr. A. R. N. Silva, to present the memento as a token of our appreciation to the chairperson of the session, Dr. Daishana Kotahachi, for his participation and invaluable cooperation to make this event a success. Before wrapping up the session, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the chairperson of the session, Dr. Darshan Kotahachi, and the judges for taking their time off with this busy schedule to participate in the event. And thank you very much for the presenters for your contribution and your enlightening ideas. And our sincere thanks also goes to the audience for your participation for the session. With that, we would conclude the technical session three of Allied Health Sciences sessions of 14th International Research Conference of KDU 2021. And uh, before concluding the session, I would like to announce who is the best uh, oral presentation of the entire Allied Health Sciences sessions and um, who is the awardee for the best poster presentation. Since the, all the presenters are not available here physically, here, this is not the awarding ceremony. Actually, we just announce their names. First, let's look at the best poster presentation. The best poster presentation award goes to the study title, Development of Anti-Acne Topical Hydrogel Formulation with Methanolic Leaf Extract of Cidium Guava. Authored by SK Javira, MOM Madhushani, MRN Madhushankar, KDS Sandarenu, SU Kankanamge, and RN Patiranan. Congratulations for the best poster presentation authors. And then the award for the best oral presentation goes to the oral presentation title, Cost Guest Complexation Behavior of NSAIDs with beta cyclodextrin, a molecular dynamic study authored by Mr. N. Narim Nelundaniya and RJKU Ranatunga. Congratulations for the best oral presentation as well as for the best poster presentation of the Allied Health Science Sessions of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalavala Defense University. With that, we would conclude the Allied Health Science Sessions of 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotelawala Defense University 2021. And I would like to thank the Vice Chancellor of KDU and the Chairperson of the IRC KDU 2021 and all the coordinators of the Allied Health Sciences sessions and the, all the presenters, authors, and the participants and the organizing committee for their invaluable contribution to make this entire session a success. 
and thanks again for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise up for the national anthem of Sri Lanka. Stay safe. Goodbye till we meet with IRC 2022. Thank you.